Track 1. Many people have immigrated to Britain and become citizens over the last 200 years, and in today's lecture, I'd like to look at the various laws or Acts of Parliament introduced to deal with those people who came to live in Britain. In 1793, there was the Aliens Act, which the British government introduced to control the number of refugees fleeing to Britain to escape the revolution in France. Compared to today, when refugees have to complete a long and complicated application process before arrival, in 1793, all that was required by the authorities was that individuals had to register at the port where they arrived. The collection of personal information started in 1844 with the Naturalisation Act, which was updated in 1870. The main difference in the 1870 Act was that applicants who wanted to stay in Britain had to have served the Crown or to have lived in the country for at least five years before being considered. Both these Acts allowed the government to control the number of people coming into the country. These changes were fairly insignificant regarding people's freedoms and the amount of state intervention involved. However, In the 20th century, this began to change. The Alien Registration Act was introduced in 1914, and when the First World War broke out, all aliens over the age of 16 had to register at local police stations, be of good character and demonstrate a working knowledge of English. The reason for this act was to create a feeling of patriotism among migrant communities and also to stop spies from Europe infiltrating the country. And after the Second World War, the meaning of British nationality was redefined again, this time to encourage residents from British colonies to come to Britain to help rebuild the country. This was the British Nationality Act of 1948. The condition was that potential migrants had to demonstrate that they wanted to work and were fit and healthy. Finally, there was the Commonwealth Immigration Act of 1962. Legislation was passed to restrict the number of Commonwealth immigrants to Britain. Although many people still wanted to come to Britain to obtain good jobs, the Act now meant applicants had to get work permits, which were given mostly to skilled immigrants such as doctors. In the next session, I want to look at more contemporary Acts. For instance, the one that was... Track 2 This morning, I'd like to focus on New York as a model for understanding immigration patterns in relation to national rather than international change. Firstly, it is important to understand that migration patterns are primarily affected by the rules of immigration which determine the conditions of entry. After that, internal changes can affect patterns considerably. To highlight my first point, let's study this diagram of Ellis Island and the process of admitting immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Upon arrival at Ellis Island, people underwent a series of examinations and questions before being allowed to enter the US. First of all, there was a medical inspection to ensure the immigrants were not bringing in any contagious diseases. Anyone who did not pass the medical examination was refused entry to New York and sent home on the next available ship. If the examination was passed, immigrants were required to take a further examination, this time a legal examination to establish whether they had any criminal convictions. After this, immigrants were able to change currency and purchase tickets for onward rail travel from New York. Having completed this simple process, immigrants were told to wait. This wait could be as long as five hours before boarding a ferry to take them to New York City. This simple system allowed millions of immigrants to enter the US and is largely responsible for the ethnic makeup of the city today. Even though the immigrants themselves may have had a variety of reasons for deciding to migrate, it was only possible because of US national immigration laws. Moving on to the second point, how changes within a country can have as much or more of an effect than those outside the country, Various parts of New York have changed radically in their ethnic makeup over the last 200 years. Communities became wealthier, 
governments introduced new laws and employment opportunities came and went. These factors affect where people choose to live or force them to move to somewhere different. For example, most people think that the population has changed in Manhattan due to the rise of its importance as a financial trade centre, which is true to some extent. But like the Ellis Island example, a change in politics, namely a change of mayor, allowed the city to boom as a financial centre, and this resulted in different types of people moving to the area. Brooklyn is an interesting example too, and we'll be looking at it as our case study later in the lecture. Whereas it used to be a predominantly working-class area of the city and therefore attracted unskilled migrant workers, nowadays its fame as a centre for up-and-coming artists and musicians means it has attracted a new and much more diverse population of middle-class residents. Finally, Queens has shown a dramatic change in its population over the last 50 years due to the airports there. This means that the number of airline staff living in the area has dramatically increased and changed the nature of the local population. Finally, I'd like to use Brooklyn as a case study of local change. Brooklyn's population has changed significantly over the years and this can most easily be seen in its economic activity. Tracing the Brooklyn industries back from the current financial services companies to manufacturing in the 1950s to shipbuilding in the 1900s, we can map this onto average wages and therefore the type and class of resident. And this has affected the population density too, which has been steadily increasing over the past 100 years from 1.5 million in 1900 through to 2 million in the middle of the 20th century to the 2.3 million inhabitants today. In fact, Brooklyn is suffering from considerable overpopulation now. But this large population increase was due not to employment, but the building of the subway, which linked Brooklyn to other areas of New York. Prior to this, at the beginning of the 20th century, the only way of transportation was the Brooklyn Bridge. Another factor which traditionally increases the desire for the middle classes to live in a particular place is the extent and type of local heritage, especially for those people with young children. In Brooklyn, this is evident in the increase in population after the construction of Coney Island. The modern-day equivalent of this is the restoration of Prospect Park, which has brought more middle-income families into the area. Track 3 Excuse me, where can I fill up my water bottle? There's a water cooler just inside the main doors. Is this your first time here? Yes, I just had my induction last week. I'm Anna. Hi, I'm John. If you have any problems and I'm around, please just ask. Have you been coming here long? Yes, I've lived here all my life, just a couple of miles away. I started coming here when I was just a kid. I suppose I'm quite a faithful member. My brother and father come here too. Wow, that's impressive. Thanks. I enjoy it so much because it basically gives me so much energy for the day. It's unusual that I'm here at this time. I work pretty hard, and so I try to fit it in before work usually. I start work at 7, so I usually get in here by about 5.30. Oh, it must still be dark at that time. Yes, it is. That must take some willpower. It does, but it's worth it. You should try an early session. It really makes you feel good about the day. How often are you planning on coming? I was thinking maybe just twice a week at the beginning and, and then build up from there. What do you think? That's a good idea. When are you thinking of coming? Probably evenings. Is it generally very busy then? It can be. I came in the evening yesterday and it was quite busy. In fact, a funny thing happened. I was on the treadmill and suddenly water started hitting me. It was the fire alarm. The sprinklers had gone off. I was absolutely soaked. It was the first time anything like that has happened, but it was pretty funny. Fortunately, it was a false alarm. <laughs> so much excitement at the gym. I think I'm going to enjoy this. Track 4 Thank you for taking the time to see me today, Mr Jones. I'd just like to take a minute to outline our new step machines. No problem. I'm interested in getting a few. We don't have any in the gym yet. That's great. Well, let me talk you through the build of the step machine. If you have a look at the sales brochure, you can see what they look like on page 14. OK. These machines are two metres tall, so they tend to stand out. The tallest part is the holding frame. At the top there, we have the main grips. These grips, when they are held, 
monitor heart rate so that the user can check they are working out at their optimum heart rate. That's great. And where does this rate show up? They'll be able to see it on the screen below. This screen is fully digital and shows not only their heart rate, but the number of steps they've taken and the distance they've travelled. On the panel there, they also have a selection of workouts. They can set it by distance or time, or by the amount of calories they want to burn. They can even set it to climb a famous mountain or hill, or walk up the Leaning Tower of Pisa, for example. <laughs> That's great. I like those more fun settings. And the great thing is you can have people climbing up Mount Everest, for example, every day for 10 years, and this machine will still be in perfect working order. It's made to last. It not only has a metallic spine, but durable pedals made from the most high-tech materials on the market. And the machine works via a wheel in the centre. That's unusual, isn't it? Yes, it is. But we find a central wheel lasts much longer than a pump system. The central wheel is attached to a bracket, which ensures each step movement is as smooth as the last. Uh, the final feature I should point out to you is the side supports, which ensure safety for all machine users. If users feel tired, they can hold on to these and slow down their stepping. I see. Well, I think I might take three of them. Track 5 OK, Alice. I just need a few more details to start your membership. Your full name is Alice Wilson, yes? No, Watson. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Which age range are you? Well, I'm just out of the 16 to 25 bracket. I'm 26 now. Great. 26 to 35? Yes. And do you have any health problems which may affect your exercise? No, I don't have any health conditions. I'll put none. Do you do any exercise at the moment? Not much. I exercise a couple of times a week. And what do you do? Well, I used to play tennis, but I stopped. Now I only go swimming. OK. And why have you decided to join up? Just to improve my fitness. I don't want to lose any weight or build muscles or anything. Fine. Well, I would recommend doing the Level 2 workout programme to begin with. It takes about 40 minutes to do the whole programme. I'll get you an information sheet so you can see what it involves. Track 6 Hi, Penny. How are you doing? Have you just been to the gym? Hi, Debbie. I'm good, thanks. Yes, I've just finished a workout. How are you? Yes, good. I'm planning on going to the gym later, but it's hard finding the time now I've got a child. <laughs> I bet it is. Have you tried any of their new exercise classes? Yes, I tried some last week. I wanted to go to yoga, but it was full up. I went to the dance class instead. It was really fun. Oh, and kickboxing last Thursday too. <laughs> That was exhausting. Well, you didn't miss much at yoga. I went there last Friday and it was far too hard. I couldn't do most of the exercises. Oh, no. Are you going to try anything else? Well, I was thinking of trying the aerobics class. My friend did that one and said the instructor was awful. Well, I'll probably give it a miss then. I've got to go to a conference next week anyway, so I'll be away from Tuesday to Friday. Oh, lucky you. Track 7 Hello and welcome to Smith's Gym. Hi there. I'd like to become a member. Yes, of course. We just need to fill out a couple of forms and then I can show you around the gym. That would be great. Let's start with the membership form. Can I have your name, please? Yes, sure. Brad Simmons. Is that Simmons with a D or without? Without. S-I-M-M-O-N-S. Got it. And can I take a contact number, please? Yes, yeah, sure. It's 04983 treble 521. OK. 04983 555531. No, uh, it's 21 at the end. Great. And do you have an email address? Yes, brad07 at elmnet.com. 
That's E L E M N E T dot com. Right. Now we've got three membership types here: bronze, which is just off peak and costs twenty one pounds a month; silver, which means you can use the gym at all times. This is thirty six pounds fifty. Or for just five pounds more, you can get a gold membership, which gives you free access to the squash and tennis courts and all classes. For now, I think I'll just take the silver. That's fine, sir. That'll be thirty-six pounds fifty a month. Great. When can I start? Well, you'll need to have an induction first. We have spaces at two thirty, four forty-five, and eight fifteen tomorrow. Would any of these be suitable? I can't do tomorrow. Do you have anything for Saturday? Is that the twelfth of November? No, it's the eleventh. Yes, yes, that's fine. Would two thirty be okay? That's fine. I'll book you in with our trainer, Rob Ellis. Now, would you like me to show you around? That would be great. Track eight. Okay, follow me. Let's go up the stairs to the main equipment room. As you can see, we have all the treadmills, bikes, and rowing machines in here, and the weights are in the corner. Great. And is that the pool over there? Can I use that with my membership? Yes, at any time. Just go through the glass doors on the left. As you can see, the pool is dominated by the diving board at the far end. It's impressively tall, and on the right-hand side of the pool, you can see we have two lanes. The first one is a slow lane for those who are trying to improve their fitness. It gets really busy. The lane on the far right is what we call the club lane because we reserve this for people who have membership. It is slightly less busy, and the members can get a really good workout in it. That sounds great. Yes, it is good. And then near us, you can see a smaller area sectioned off nearly halfway across the pool. This area is where we put the school groups, which come in the late afternoons during the week, usually from about four. We keep them confined to that space so that the other end can be used for free swimming. And what is the little round pool for? We call that the toddlers' pool. It's not very deep, and the mothers often bring their children in to teach them to swim in it. Great. Well, I'm glad I can use the pool. It will be good to vary my exercise. Definitely. When do you think you'll be coming? Most likely in the evenings. I'd like to come on Saturdays, but I often work then, so I think I'll have to miss that day and then come on Sundays. Oh, so you'll be a regular visitor. That's great news. Can I ask why you chose Smith's Gym? Well, actually, the television advert prompted me to join. It makes exercising look so much fun. I always thought going to the gym would be monotonous. No, not at all. It can be a lot of fun. My aim is to reach my optimum fitness. At the moment, I think I'm a bit unhealthy, so I'd like to change that. Well, give it some time, and I'm sure you will. Now, shall we go back and complete the payment details?